So, ladies and gentlemen, we will start the session pulling an elephant out of tar pit. Let's welcome Ed and Stars. <laughs> so, Stars has been Yahoo for 12 years as a software architect, architect, and Ed also has been Yahoo for four years. So, today they will give a story for Yahoo. Please enjoy it. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ed Cray. I work at Yahoo, uh, and I'm a technical program manager in search. And my mission is to make things better together. And I'm Stas. I'm a software architect. Why do you work where you work? Is it the money? Is it the people? The challenges? Why do you get up every morning and do it, what it is you do? Goats. At Yahoo, behind Yahoo, there's a hill. And on that hill, about nine months out of the year, it's brown. Nothing grows. Three months out of the year, grass grows there. It used to be we would have lawnmowers go and mow that. And it was loud. It was noisy. It was bad for the environment, expensive. The city of Sunnyvale came, and they started bringing goats a few years back. The lawn gets fertilized, the goats get fed, and it looks cool. Everybody wins. So we're preparing for this presentation, just starting to prepare. This is in February of this year. And we look outside, we see goats. It's an event. Everybody goes take, take pictures of goats. So we look at each other and it's like, wouldn't it be cool to put pictures of goats into our presentation? So let's do it. So we go up there and we take pictures and you can see goats, you see our campus. One thing to notice, uh, they're, they're enclosed. There is a fence around them because otherwise they run away. And we want them swarming on one piece of, on one task at a time. And tomorrow we'll give them a different task. Now, one thing you don't see, but important to know, the fence is electrified. And uh, if we have engineering e managers in the audience, think about that. So we're taking pictures, and I'm taking pictures, and Ed is taking pictures, and behind me I hear, ouch, turn around, it's Ed. He got shocked. He survived, don't worry. He will never be the same again, though. <laughs> Let's all agree. We all want to take pride in our work. We want to ship often. We want to delight our users, learn about them using our product, and we want to delight them even more. We want to ship with quality so that th those users don't run away. And we all want to do meaningful work. Nobody wants to do monkey work. So let's start with a show of hands. Raise your hand and keep it up if you launch to production at least once a year. That should be everybody, at least once a year. And keep it up if you launch to production at least once a quarter, once a month, once a week, once a day. OK, one person who launches once a week, no more frequently than that. Just interesting statistic, and we do it all across the world. Let's do another show of hands. Quality. Raise your hand if you're insanely proud of the quality of software that you put out to production. One hand, two hands, three hands. Wow, that's a lot for an audience of this size. Raise your hand if you want to be insanely proud of the quality of software that you put out to production. So we all agree. What if I told you that there was a way for you to dramatically increase the quality of your software and save a bunch of money in the process? And the answer is Hawaii. So here's what you do. You take your QA team, you put them on a plane. First class ticket, all expenses paid trip to Hawaii. Best resort. Make sure to take away their laptops. We don't want them working. You've been working them to death. So make sure they go there for three months, six months, long time so that they can recoup. And when they come back six months later, I guarantee the quality of your software will have increased and you will have saved a bunch of money in the process. So Yahoo turned 20 years old this year. Can you believe it? What were you doing 20 years ago? For me, I was 
making applications for college in my parents' basement. I think I was on AOL on a 56K modem at that point. That was a long time ago. There was no iPhone, there was no Google. This was before all of that. So Yahoo started in this age of the internet and we were a guide to the internet and quickly launched a lot of services. We had Messenger, Finance, Yahoo Sports, growing really rapidly. We're sort of like a bunch of speedboats that all had different technology, different products, just going as fast as we can. Gradually we grew in size, both technically and also people, products, and we slowed down. We slowed down, in some cases, down to about three releases a year. And we did a lot of different things to try to get out of that decline in the speed that we were operating in, and many of them did not work. A few of them, the things we tried did, and we're, we're gonna share with you both the things that worked and the things that didn't work. And a lot of these kind of talks you hear about, oh, there were dark days and we did something, and it was great, and then ray of light and we're off. But we're gonna actually share a lot of the things that didn't work in our journey. So I started Yahoo four years ago, and when I started, I was working as an Agile coach, and about half of my time was spent with the ads team. And there was a billboard. That billboard that I was showing you was right around uh, the Soma district, right by the jail. As you come in on I-80, you'd see it. Um, and it was a symbol for Yahoo. Well, it was torn down about a w couple weeks after I started. And it was really the symbol of the decline of Yahoo to that point. Working with the ads team, it was very illustrative of kind of the challenges Yahoo had at that point. Now, this was a huge system. So we had a half a billion users. There were about 100, million, 100 billion unique events going through the system every day. If you process those one per second, it would take you about five years to process. So it gives you the size of the scale that we were operating at that time. And we had hundreds of billions of dollars going through this system and hundreds of unique software components. And we had hundreds of engineers working on the system. So it was big. And yes, we were slow. Stas, why don't you tell them a story about how slow we were? Do I have to? <laughs> so this is um, about four or five years ago. Uh, my manager calls me up and says, hey, let's go have a coffee. So we meet up and he says, the CTO is getting serious about this thing called continuous integration. And we all get what it is, right? but we don't know how to make it happen across the organization of 600 people. Can you look into that? Sure, you can look into that. So I work on this one piece of the system. The system is huge, Ad mentioned 600 people, and I'm working on this one system and I intimately know how it's put together. But I don't know about other parts of the system. So I decided the way to go about this is to pick a very complex component and go sit with the developers on that team. And I was fortunate enough that the most complex component had a friend of mine on that, on that team. And let's call him Steve. So I go to Steve and I say, hey, how do, you, how do you put your software together? And Steve says, well, we show up on Monday and Linda, Linda is their manager. Linda gives us tasks. And those are weekly tasks. We're supposed to work on them. So they show up on Monday. They get their tasks from Linda. And they go retreat into their caves and they start typing. And Steve is a very senior engineer, which means he can type really fast. So by Wednesday, he's done. And Wednesday night, I don't know what you guys do when you complete your work. He commits, he emails his manager. He says, hey, Linda, I'm done. And she's online all the time, so she replies immediately. It's like, thank you, Steve, so much. I know you've been working so hard. I can always rely on you. When everybody commits, we we're ready for, when everybody completes their tasks, we will be ready for the build. So Thursday night comes around, she sends out a reminder team. I know everybody's working so hard. Just friendly reminder, tomorrow noon, all check-ins should be in. And tomorrow noon, Friday noon comes around, and they're almost done. There's just a couple of things that they want to get in, and they're not yet complete. And if they don't get them in, that means a week of delay. So they all pile in, teamwork, everybody piles in. Steve gets involved. By 3 o'clock, they're done. Everything is in. Feeling good. So Linda replies to the team, team, incredible work this week. Take a deserved rest this weekend. We're ready for the build. The next five minutes later comes an email from Linda to Bob, the builder. 
says, Bob, we're ready for the build. And you can just imagine Bob. He's sitting there with his three monitors, and poop pops up this uh, email from the team. He opens up a window. At that point, we were using Subversion. So Subversion checkout, waiting, waiting, waiting. You know how long it is with Subversion. Type in one, types in one command, make, enter. What do you think happened? What? That's somebody showing explosion. Yes, it had no chance of ever working. It wasn't integrating for a week. And I'm not even talking about unit test failures. I'm talking about compilation issues. So this is not their first rodeo. They've done this before. They immediately branch. And they start fixing this thing on the branch Friday night over the weekend. Turns out Steve works every single weekend. Uh, Monday they show up. Finally, on Wednesday, this thing is working. It takes that long. So on Thursday, they can try to deploy to an environment. And in that environment, first, things don't even get, they cannot get it deployed, then things don't start up. So it takes them Thursday, Friday to get this thing up so that on Monday, QA can show up and test it. And then Monday, QA shows up, and they run their tests, and what do you think happens? Same thing, explosion. Basic features don't work, right? So they start fixing these things for QA so that QA is not blocked on the same branch. Meanwhile, they just caught another branch on Friday because Friday build was broken. And they're working on new features on the main line. And they continue this insanity for six weeks. And at some point they say, okay, 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 done. Let's stabilize. So this is what their release schedule looked like. Each cell is a week. So six weeks of development, 10 weeks of stabilization, four weeks of launch. And I wish, I wish this was just that team. But the truth is that the entire organization was on exactly this schedule. Six plus four plus 10, that's 20 weeks. If you overlap, you can play some tricks, you can overlap launch and development, you can squeeze three releases per year. So per year, you could have three releases. That was our life. And you know, I'm an architect, I suppose, I'm supposed to care about code and components and stuff like this. But people are people too, and people are in pain. And we have very scientific measurements of pain, and they're in a lot of pain. The base level of pain is extremely high. It is, and on top of that, because there's a production issue is not stopped. This is something that I did not mention. They're working on new features, but meanwhile, stuff is breaking in production. Serious issues, literally every day. So Steve, on top of all of his work for the new release, he has to deal, as a senior engineer, he has to deal with all these production issues. So you see the base level of pain is high. And on top of that, you have this roller coaster going on. You know, the pain rises towards the, end, towards the end of the release as you get close to sign off. Then a couple of weeks of respite, and then it rises again. Something that we call the roller coaster of pain. It is immoral to put people on the roller coaster of pain. And we, as engineering leaders, fail them. I, as an engineering leader, fail them. And it's not because we're immoral people. It's just we didn't know any better. And not because we're incompetent. It's because the prob problem is very complex. All right, so we're on that roller coaster of pain. It turns out we're not the only people that are having this experience of pain. So our developers are unhappy, product is unhappy, but also our users are unhappy. Users aren't getting the quality they want. Developers are taking way too long and they're in pain and they're always fighting these issues. And product has a bunch of things that's in the roadmap that's not getting done because we're fixing all the issues that Stoss mentioned. When I would walk the halls, this was the sentiment that would resonate. And as this developer captured it, I thought, really succinctly. And you know that feeling, right? It's that feeling when you wake up for work and you don't really want to go to work that day. You know, people are working hard. It's not because we weren't working hard. It's that it didn't feel like you were making a difference. In addition, if you look at this, that six weeks of, of development time is about a third of the total cycle. And that's the only part of the cycle that we're really adding value. So two-thirds of what we're doing is complete waste. We're basically 
finding and fixing the bugs we introduced in that six week cycle. So product managers say, well, I've got all these things I want to do, but like the engineering managers are looking and saying, well, I can't do that because I've spent all this time finding and fixing problems. And they know they want to try a whole bunch of new things, but we can't do it. So isn't this gross? This is our world, right? People are swimming in their own waste. They're creating all these problems, and then they're finding and fixing them. And it, it's kind of awful, and it's yucky, right? Who wants to swim in your own waste? In addition, we're slow. So yes, yeah, so let's say we finally get that release out. Well, we probably didn't, couldn't estimate exactly what the impact of those features would be. Some might be great, some might not. The feedback for those would take another two cycles to get into the product. So there was delays, and our feedback cycles were really long. So we were like this elephant, stuck in the tar pit. And we had our competitors running circles around us. They're not standing still. They're introducing new features into the market, some that were extremely competitive, especially in that period of 2008. And we wanted to get out. We just didn't know how. But we tried a lot of different things. So Stas, why don't you tell them what some of the things we tried? As we were preparing for this presentation, we found this quote by Michael Jordan. I think it captures the spirit of those years as we were trying. And before I can tell you about all of our attempts, the ones that failed, the ones that succeeded, I need to explain a little bit about our system. So let's say that you have a system running in production and you need to deploy four features to it. Underneath, because we're serving such huge traffic, the system needs to scale. And one typical way of scaling a system like this is you break it up into, system, into subsystems. Each one is responsible for their own uh, specific functionality, right? very functionality focused. And we have something like 15 to 20 of those big systems underneath. And then each system is further broken down into individual components, potentially 10 to 15 to 30 components. So the consequence of this is that if you're trying to de develop features across all of these systems, the features end up being broken down in multiple places, looking something like this. It, is not un it was not uncommon to see a feature being implemented in 15 different places, and then this thing needs to integrate. So the thinking is, before you can deploy to production, you need to certify feature in a dedicated environment, something that we call end-to-end, -end, or E2E for short. And Further theoretical thinking is that if you go, before you get into that environment, uh, each individual system needs to be certified prior to entering the, envir the environment. That's theory. In practice, this is very hard. If you, if you are responsible for one piece of the puzzle, and there's a total of 15 pieces of that puzzle, it's actually very hard to certify your specific piece, because you you're integrating with all these other ones, and you need to test to contract. And that's not easy. So a bunch of people make this decision to go straight into end-to-end -end environment, and that's where they will do the testing. Remember this, remember this picture, 10 weeks of stabilization? It is because of that end-to-end -end environment. Because everybody is deploying untested code in there, multiple features, multiple untested features, the environment is always unstable. We finally managed to stabilize it, like magic, every time. On the last day of, of the release, right before we're supposed to sign off, we sign off and then it's broken again, right? So the quality is not just bad, it's unpredictably bad. Then we go into launch. And all of these individual pieces of the puzzle, they declared orchestration dependencies on each other. So you have one set of orchestration dependencies overlapping with another set, another set. So you have these weird circular dependencies. So launching a product, again, the launch is completely unpredictable, impacting the quality. So we have unpredictability. We have Vegas. And what, do you, what would you do to get out of this mess? The instinctive feeling we had was we have to go after quality. But it's actually very hard to do it in this very unstable environment. So this was a very conscious decision that we will not address quality at the beginning. We're going after predict predictability. Our goal is predictability, first step. So with this, we went ahead and we established two rules. One is quality gates. Before you can enter into an environment, so there are certain quality gates that you have to meet. Second one is we have a launch sequence, pre prescribed launch sequence 
fixed for every release. Probably not the most optimal launch sequence for every release, but it gives us predictability. The result, we have a factory. I, does anybody know what this car is? Just, I don't expect you to. This car is called Yugo, produced in Yugoslavia back in the day. In 1980s, it was sold in the United States, and it's infamous for bad quality. In fact, Yugo is a synonym for bad quality. So we have a factory. We can reliably produce bad quality. But it's a start. It's a start, oh, and we can start iterating. So the first iteration is, hey, let's do Agile. We'll go sprints, right? two, mile, two week milestones. The thinking is that we will align features to these two week milestones, and we get them into QA, to QA earlier. QA will spend more time on them, and then the quality will improve, and over time, the bandwidth will improve. That's the thinking. The result is nothing like that really happened. Marginal improvements in quality because the most complex features, the most involved features were still aligned towards the very end. And we could not test them until the very end. But this was an extremely important step in our evolution because we started looking at the world in terms of features, not in terms of releases. All the planning, all the execution was done in terms of features. Important step for us but also an interesting step in the development mindset. When developers started thinking about the world in terms of features, an interesting thing happened. They started creating feature branches. 20 features, 20 branches. Have you ever tried to merge 20 branches? I have. Don't, I did it twice. This is the stuff that you tell you, your grandkids about. Like, Grandpa, tell us about the time that you merged 20 branches. Never do it again. So what became clear is that we're coupled. We're extremely coupled. We noticed that some teams are moving faster than others, and they're meeting these earlier milestones, but the entire system is still as fast as the slowest team. We had releases where one bug that was, could not be found by a team, a small team of three people in Bangalore, India, held, in a sense, held hostage the entire release. 600 people are waiting for these people to find a, that bug. What are you going to do to them? You cannot make them find that bug. So we were coupled. What do you do when you're coupled? Call in the architects. So we all got together and we sat in a room and we took a, took a careful look at every major interface in, in the system. And we came back with this result. We said, you know, the interfaces allow us to decouple. They're actually quite good. Our problem is execution coupling. Kind of like this picture. You have nice roads, they allow you to move fast, but you need to figure out how to negotiate the intersections first. Oh, so that's not a technical problem. We don't need to invest any resources into this. We can just plan our way out of this, right? And how did that work out? You can probably guess. So we enter the Soviet-style five-year plan. We thought, okay, so maybe we can just identify the dependencies and sequence things in a way that it'll all work out. Well, that didn't work because of this problem. So one of the directors of engineering said, basically, we are trying to plan with two unknowns. How many people or resources do we have? And how big is this thing, the level of effort? There are two unknowns because it's unpredictable. Who's going to be available, when, and then how big is this feature going to be, the level of effort? So that was not going to work. So again, life still sucks for everyone. Even though we're trying to plan better, we have some more predictability we're trying to bake into the system, people still don't want to come to work, even though they're working really hard. But there was some light that was at the end of the tunnel, some glimmers of hope. Tell us about those, Stas. <laughs> so the first one was uh, continuous integration. Uh, in, we had a very illustrative example when in September of 2010, a system, huge system, 6,000 machines involved, they tried to launch and they found the bug after they launched. They rolled back, put their best engineers on it, took a couple of weeks again to certify, to launch it, found another bug. And they repeated it for th until it was finally launched in December. So three months of delay. Three months of delay to their features, three months of their customers being unhappy, three months of their best engineer's times wasted. And they were so desperate that they were willing to give anything a try. 
and I showed up with this idea of continuous integration and they were desperate, they decided to go for it, they had nothing to lose. And just within six months, they launched for the first time in their history without a rollback. And this was July of 2011 at that point, and to this day, so they're still in production, they've only had one rollback. And even that was not software related. So we said, aha, CI, definitely part of our success recipe. We're very sure about it. The second thing was Scrum. Scrum, we tried Scrum, I guess, I think Ed convinced us. We tried it with six different teams and it did not work everywhere. But where it did, we ran these pilots. We really liked, we liked it a lot. We liked the fact that the team is focused on users. We liked the fact that developers and production, or in production engineering and product people and QA, they're all working together and they seem happier. So we said, okay, CI, Agile, that's, let's go for it. That's going to be a recipe for our success. So we tried many different things with it. First, we mandated CI for the entire organization. We said everybody must do CI. We got all the managers together and for three days we trained them on CI, Agile, managing technical debt. We set up communities of practice. We brought in external consultants to help us. Did release planning sessions, 200, 300 people in the room, huge sessions. Scrum of Scrums, Meta Scrum, Portfolio Kanban, Impediments Clearinghouse, Agile Council, did I hear more tools? It's all about the tools. Remember, you heard it here. But life still sucks. And still launching three times a year. The quality is still in the toilet. And Ed refers to this feeling of waking up and not feeling like you want to go to work. I hope you actually don't know this feeling because it's extremely debilitating. You wake up and you gave this your best for the past couple of years. You followed all the best practices. You read all the books, or they are all the articles. You paid insane money for external consultants and things are still not improving. And you're ready to pull your hair out. And now looking back at this three years later, it's so clear to me, you can't iterate your way to a transformation. You need something bigger. Fire! Change everything but your wife and children. In 1995, Chairman Lee, in, uh, outside of a factory in Korea, dumped thousands of phones onto the pavement of the parking lot, and he brought all of the employees out to watch as he set fire to those phones. And he took a bulldozer and he ran over the remains once the fire died down. Turns out he was sending those phones as gifts to friends in New York, and they were inoperable. This is what moment many people see as the turning point for Samsung from being a national company doing fairly well in their market to being a global company that now is dominant in many different industries, including the incredibly competitive smartphone market. It's when they started focusing on quality. Two years before, Chairman Lee brought all of his senior management team to a hotel in Frankfurt, and he delivered what he called the Frankfurt Declaration. And this was two days of him and others talking, but the thing that the people who were there remember the most is this statement, change everything but your wife and children. This means that everything that we do as a company needs to be challenged in order for us to make this shift shifting to focusing on quality first. At Yahoo, we didn't need to set anything on fire. Things were already on fire. We had about everything you could imagine. We had activist investors. We had CEOs that were changing about every five months. We had attrition annualized at 60%, at least for the ads group. There was a real crisis. So you've heard this statement, never let a crisis go to waste, but what does it really mean? So we were at a turning point. So you know you have options, you always have options. You could just decide to roll over and die. You could decide, we're gonna get out of that business. It's too complicated. Who wants to deal with all those problems and servers and people? 
Let's just find someone else to monetize the, our properties. Well, we had a couple visionary leaders that decided we were going to stay and we were going to fight. Or we we're going to fight to win. But in order to do that, we needed to change some things. So we've, we made a decision. The senior vice president said, we are going to change the way we operate. And it took a lot of guts. So if you've ever done this, jumped off of a cliff or made a big change in your life and gone from something that's familiar to something that's unfamiliar, maybe it's even like changing careers or changing jobs or any big change, it's a little bit scary. But they had the guts to do it, to say, we're going to make this change. After we did that, then we decided that we needed to get everyone together around this plan. So yes, you have a visionary leader who's making a decision to change, but it doesn't just happen on its own. So one of the things we did was something that was extremely effective. And if I ever have the opportunity to go through one of these changes again, I'm going to do it exactly the same way. We brought the managers, both the senior vice president, vice presidents, directors, senior managers of engineering together. And over a series of two weeks of offsite meetings, we talked about what we were going to need to do. And there were some things that were non-negotiable, like there was going to be a change. The team was going to be responsible for quality, among other things. Mm -hmm. And this was, I think, the thing that made it work because oftentimes middle management is cited as the problem. Like you go to a lot of conferences and they're like, oh, like I, this all sounds great. I really want to do that in my company, but I can't convince my boss. Like how do I get people to agree to do this thing? A lot of that is on selling and people, engineers need to be better about selling and learning how to sell their ideas. But a lot of it's about getting people on board. And this was the most effective way I've ever seen to make that happen. So what happened was people emerged and it's like, yeah, we're going to change, but you're going to tell us how. We're going to empower you. And the people who were the doubters, some of them changed and said, I really think we can make this work. And those were the people who became the new leaders of that organization. They were the true leaders. And there were people who dug in their heels and were like, no way, I'm not going to do that. That sounds crazy. Those people were no longer the leaders. Some of them stayed in the organization took different roles, others left. But the important thing is that the people who were all in were there to stay and figure it out. So what was the strategy, Stas? So this is the strategy we came up with. Sat in that room for multiple weeks and came up with this strategy. Focus on speed. It's not about agile, it's not about CI, it's about delighting your customers, shipping again and delighting them even more. One team, one team to rule them, rule them all. No more throw it over the wall to QA, throw it over the wall to release engineering. One team responsible for software from commit to production. The thinking here is eliminate moral hazard. Developers must feel the pain when software breaks. And I lost focus here. Decouple for real. Remember this picture with end-to-end -end environment? Well, because of this, this is what was holding us together. We could not decouple as long as that environment is there. And we took a very close look at our data, and we figured out that pretty much all of the bugs that we're finding in, those, in that environment should have been found before. So we said, let's kill this environment. Everybody just goes straight to production. If you need to certify end-to-end -end functionality, do it in production, utilizing flexible feature flags. Commit to, we committed to continuous delivery. The thinking here was, we saw the impact of continuous integration. We thought that with continuous delivery, we'll, we'll see an even better, better impact, bigger impact. Let's define continuous delivery, though, because across the industry, there is no one definition. In our definition, it's a very strict definition, very simple definition. Continuous delivery means commit to production without human intervention. No humans between commit and production. I even put a picture together for this. Here's a human typing. Continuous delivery pipeline takes software to production. Where there is human, there are humans. Everywhere else, no humans allowed. CI only plays in that first box over here. We thought that if we automate the rest of the pipeline, we'll see much better results. We also, also thought that, hey, as, as we speed up, traditionally in software engineering and in software industry, we have to trade off speed and quality. 
because humans cannot keep up with speed. We thought that, hey, if we automate everything, computers will be able to keep up and we will not lose quality as we speed up. That was the thinking. We committed to Agile. We thought that we needed a process, an engineering process, to make things work. We, at that point, we had enough experience with Agile and specifically Scrum, and we committed to Scrum across, across the organization. At this point, the organization is a, is a thousand people. We also reorganized. We used to have one, this one huge organization and everybody talking to everybody. Now we said we'll have smaller units. We called them pods. And within pod, it's 40 to 50 people. The idea is that everybody knows everybody. Because once you ex go beyond 40 to 50 people, these human interactions, these human relationships start breaking down. So bro broke the organization into pods. Within the pod, 40 to 50 people, developers, product, everybody together in one pod. Within the pod, we had individual scrum teams, seven to 10 people per scrum team. The pods are expected to be self-executing, self-motivating. Their job is to launch, production, launch to production as fast as they can, just release product, release product. And oh yeah, they cannot, ex they cannot impose orchestration requirements on other pods. That's a very important point. To summarize, focus on speed, one team to rule them all, decouple, commit to CD, embrace agile, and reorganize. And then we went into execution. All right, so we had our plan. So how did we get started? Um, one failure mode uh, often that I saw with organizations that were doing transformation is that they would overanalyze and over plan. How are we gonna make this happen? It's better to get started and learn where the friction points are than to overanalyze. So we got started, this was the year before. We have our three releases a year, and this is uh, 2012. And so we, in March, uh, we had our release, and we made the decision to go right before that. We were forming our strategy between March and June, and these were then those offsite meetings were happening. Um, and then we put together our execution plan where we were gonna train everyone in the organization. At this point, we merged with the data group and so it was about a thousand people. Um, and we got started. So over the period of six weeks, we trained uh, 800 people uh, and got them started. So we'd have sessions where this would be the basic agenda. And only about an hour of that was someone like me talking to a group like you about theory. The rest was the teams actually working together, getting started. So you see, we do an intro to Scrum and you see some people with their arms crossed, you know, what am I here for? This is some kind of training, okay. Then the teams are getting started and they're forming their actual teams. These are their teams putting together their working agreement here and the teams are defining what done means for their team. They're putting together their first initial product backlog and doing grooming, and then they're putting together their first sprint plan. And then they get started. And many people that afterwards, they went back to their old teams, like, okay, that was interesting, but uh, I'm ready to come back to my work. But that person was like, no, this is, your new team is over there. You gotta go back. <laughs> we got started right away. Um, so we had a number of releases. So you see these little dots are releases, um, but then, you know how you, if you're a leader in your team or your organization, you might have this plan, okay, we're gonna dismantle this environment, but then gradually there's resistance, and so you're not quite gonna follow through on the plan. So that happened to us where originally we were gonna dismantle that big end-to-end -end environment here. And then we had the battle. So. If you've ever watched the Lord of the Rings, you know there's this beginning period before the whole saga when um, they were gonna defeat the evil uh, guy, Sauron. But they didn't quite do it. Um, and, but they went back to their peaceful life and then eventually he resurfaced. So this was like our end-to-end -end environment. And for one reason or another, people would convince us, well, it's too risky. I don't think you really wanna do this. You don't really mean to take away our safety net. Do you know we have 20,000 automated functional tests there? Never mind that only 6,000 were really ones we paid attention to and we ignored the rest. Still, uh, there was a lot of doubt. But credit goes to the leadership that they 
stuck to their guns. They had guts to say, no, we're going to dismantle this environment. So we actually dismantled it eventually. And then after that, we had our first true continuous delivery pipeline, so no humans from check-in to production. Then we get into weekly releases. So we have a weekly release cadence. Um, and that's when we really feel like we're starting to, to turn a corner. Um, and that's almost a year after we make the decision to, to go for this. And then we release freely um, about a year after we start launching and, and executing. Remember the uh, value, so the value curves, if we start, if we just assume every release, every feature has the same amount of value, this is how the value looks. And as we release more often, it increases. Now, as you know, this isn't accurate because sometimes you may introduce a bug and it might have negative value or you might learn from your customers and you don't have any value. So reality, it's going up and down, but we're getting to a point where we can start to learn from our customers. And this is what real agility is. It's business agility, being able to learn from your customers. Okay, well, let's talk about the pain scale. So we're still on this roller coaster, even as we make the decision, so ah, things are painful, and then they're not. Okay, I'm familiar with this level of pain. Then they're painful again, and not so much. Oh, but still, we're still in this mode where we have these biggish releases, and then it spikes, and then it goes down after we take down that that end-to-end uh, uh, -end environment. And by here, we actually go below that base level of pain when we have weekly releases. And an interesting thing happens once we do that, then if teams hit any problems, they're much more likely to solve them because they don't like that pain anymore, especially the teams that lived here. They're like, ah, oh, I don't want to go back there. So they are much more likely to run around those problems, use another team uh, if they need to, or use another platform, to find a way to solve those problems. So we focused on the agility, again, that business agility, over strictly following Scrum. Uh, Scrum was good to get the muscle movements of shipping frequently, but it wasn't the end state we were after. We really wanted to be able to ship frequently, like Stoss said. Um, many scaling methods, there's a lot of them out there now that targeted to companies like yours and mine that say, you know, we need this framework for scaling. Agile's fine in a small team, a startup, but when you get big, you need a lot of stuff. Well, we did some of that stuff and we realized a lot of it was waste. So the true value of Agile is actually keeping things simple. So if you have a process that you can't explain in more than maybe uh, 10 minutes, or if you have a change program that's more than like three points, you probably need to simplify. So my challenge to all of you is to bring simple back. Uh, so what were the results? So we did all this work. What were the results? In short, great success. <laughs> um, the speed increase. We used to launch three times a year. Everybody used to launch three times a year. After 12 months or so, we start, people started launching. Some teams were launching daily. At least everybody was launching multiple times a week. Some teams were launching multiple times a day, actually. Uh, I don't have the data for ads, but then we did this thing across the company. And then within five months of implementing continuous delivery, we quadrupled our number of production launches. And the quality, you know, traditionally we trade off speed and quality. Because of continuous delivery, we didn't have to. Quality improved. And this was a quote from one of the production engineering VPs. Uh, change success apparently means you launch things to production and they don't break. And it was unheard of for them to see 100% change success. Uh, did not expect to see this, now, now it makes sense. As you start launching more often, just naturally you start breaking things down into smaller things. Monolithic architectures actually work when you have monolithic releases. Smaller releases over time, we're still seeing this. Things are breaking down even further. 52 weeks of value. We used to have 18 weeks of value. Now all we do, all of our developers do is code. They code functionality and they code tests. Oh, and they meet too, so if we could only get rid of those meetings. And they're happy for it, too. We actually did, did a survey, and yes, we saw the developers are feeling happier. In other words, shipping way more often, with le less cost, higher quality, and we're very happy doing it. This cost a lot. This wasn't free. 
We, it costs us money to buy tools, to buy platforms. It costs us to invest into continuous delivery platforms. We put 17 people, 17 engineers, and said, you will deliver platforms for continuous delivery. We paid for external consultants. We postpone important features for several months. And it cost people a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. It took a lot of effort from a lot of people. Does anybody know what this means, ad astra peras para? It's Latin, it means to stars through difficulties, through obstacles. And many of you might be going through this uh, today. You might be going through the same transformation, or maybe you've gone through that transformation, or maybe you're just planning. So next year, we hope to see you here, and we hope to see you telling your story of success. And with this, we will close. Ad astra peras para. Thank you very much. So we're out of time, but we will be happy to take questions uh, after. Let's officially close the session, but we will hang out here. And